out of the dust. And when you read that passage, it's, it's a very intimate passage there. Uh, because God spoke everything else. And then we read that God formed man. Then we learned about the fall. And, and how it damaged relationships, not only between you and me, but more importantly between us and our Heavenly Father. Last week, uh, we learned that, uh, or we, we studied that, you know, sin went from just eating the fruit and, of, of diso- and then disobeying God and, and all of a sudden guilt and shame, but now it it went down that path and it got darker to murder and as we're going to see here in the story of Noah sin just engulfed the world it engulfed God's creation to the extent that God said I've had it I've had enough I regret having made man and that's really sad that God would regret having created that which he said was very good. So as we get into this story, um, the story of Noah actually covers about five, well, we're going to, it covers uh, five, six, seven, eight, and half of nine, plus I'm going to go back a little bit into four. So we're, co- we're going to cover five chapters. So I'm going to go through it fairly quickly, but we're going to stop at a few points, kind of like if you're on a tour and you're going through and the tour guide points out these little nuggets and tidbits here. I want to make some observations as we go through because I believe they're important. So whenever, if you guys will bring up uh, Genesis 9, 8 through 17. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the the earth with you. Of all that go out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth and God said this is the token of the covenant which I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. We're kind of starting at the end. Here, this is after the whole ordeal. Noah has gone through the flood and now they're coming out of the ark and God is making a covenant. And what's interesting about this covenant with the rainbow is it's not just between him and man. If you'll notice the wording is in there, if you want to take and go back and look, multiple times God says, between me and the earth and all the creatures. Because remember, God did not just destroy mankind. He destroyed everything that was not in the ark. So how did we get here? How did, how did creation get to the point where God had to feel like and then act on those feelings destroy mankind well i'm going to we're going to go back to last week we left with cain being condemned to wandering and he was cast out into the land of nod which means the land of wandering 
We're going to kind of pick up there for a little bit because I want you to see how the Bible compares and contrasts the line of Cain to the line of Seth. Now, Cain is important in that we learn uh, some things about Cain and we learn also kind of how the magnitude of sin and uh, just kind of increased exponentially. Brittany, if you can bring up uh, Genesis 4. Seven, right. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad beget Mahujel, and Mahujel beget Methushel, and Methushel beget Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Ada bare Jabal. And this is a little bit important because uh, we kind of learn that uh, shortly after, you know, creation and everything, they were expelled and, and all this, that uh, uh, I guess as opposed to what uh, um, atheism and Darwinism would have us teach, um, you know, man didn't just start out living in caves, and, and perhaps he did a little bit, but much earlier in the life of man, um, they were living in tents. Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and have cattle. Um, go ahead to the next one, please. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was a father such that handle the harp and pipe. So music was created. They were creating. There was intelligent design here. Just here we see that. Okay, continue. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal came, the forger of every cutting instrument of brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. And here's where it descends into darkness. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man for wounding me, and a young man for bruising me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. No, oh, just hold on just a second there. So... Throughout the line of Cain, because remember Cain killed Abel, and God said whoever would kill Cain would be avenged seven times. And if you weren't here last week, what that means was, is you know, we understand eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Back then, if you killed somebody, you were going to be killed. That was the punishment. That was the payment. So what God was saying, if somebody killed Cain, seven relatives of whoever killed Cain would have to die. So what's Lamech saying in his braggadocious? Well, I kill these people, but I'm more important than Cain. Because they wounded me. I mean, Abel just, he was just mad at Abel. So we can see rationalization now continuing to take over. And how sin is becoming more manifest in the world. Okay, now we can move on. Now compare that with the line of Seth. It's interesting, in Cain's line, just to point this out, they don't give ages and dates type of a thing, as they will in Seth's line. And in Seth's line, there's nobody who created anything, except there's a couple of people who are very important. Of, of note, in, in well, there's more than that, If but up to this point of the story of Noah, there's a couple people in Seth's line who are of significant note. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For she said, God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. Then began men to call upon the name of Jehovah. So there was a period of time when mankind was kind of turning back to God, but it would appear that it was kind of of the tribe of Seth. 
Okay. So this is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. And we're going to skip down to, uh, let's skip down to 524, please. All right. And as, you know, because from where we started in, in the last part of chapter 4 and the beginning of verse the beginning of chapter 5 was this and Adam had and he lived and, 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 and a repetition was taking place but this is of note and we're talking about Enoch and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him it's important because a similar phrase is used when we start to discussing Noah this walked with God Okay, when we ask, well, why did God choose Noah? And, and, and the Bible alludes to it some. Um, and we have here, you know, like, once again, and Methuselah lived 180 and seven years and beget Lamech. Here, another Lamech, but this guy, this Lamech was not wicked like the other Lamech, like his distant cousin. Go ahead. And, and Methuselah lived after he beget Lamech 780 and two years and beget sons and daughters. And the point of this is showing that, you know, the, the earth is being filled, it's being populated. There's more than just these people who are being mentioned. But because these people are all connected to part of the story, that's why, um, that's why they're mentioned there. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years, and he died. And as... If you don't know, Methuselah is the oldest recorded person in the Bible. Um, and Lamech lived 180 and two years and begat a son. And it was kind of interesting as I was going through and reading this, I got to thinking, wow, those who lived the longest waited, seemed to kind of wait longer to have children. I don't know if that has anything to do with how short or long our lives are, but, uh, you know, um, I just found it interesting because after... Uh, although Noah, he waited till like 500 years before he had kids. We'll find that out here in just a little bit. But I just found it interesting that those that seemed to live longest recorded in the Bible waited the longest to have kids. Anyway, I'm not saying anything bad about kids, but uh, you know, if there's a correlation to be made, I guess somebody can figure that out. And he called his name Noah, saying, now this is important, I've read this story many times, never preached on it, but until now, as I'm preaching and studying it, some things start coming into focus, and it's like, as we talked in class this morning, you can read stuff, and, and all of a sudden you read it again, and, oh, I never knew this was in here. This same shall comfort us in our work and in the toil of our hands, which cometh because of the ground which Jehovah hath cursed. What's the implication here? The implication here is somehow Noah was going to be the antidote to the curse that God gave. Now, I don't know that he was going to be the antidote in the way that his father wanted because of the name, but we know that Noah was going to play an important part here. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 590 and five years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it came to pass, when man began to multiply on the face of the ground, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them, wise of all that they chose. And Jehovah said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for that, excuse me, for that he also is flesh, yet shall his days be a hundred and twenty years. Just kind of hold up there for just a little bit. Now this section here in, in, in chapter 6, actually, Brittany, would you go back to verse 1, please, of chapter 6? Thank you. Um, we can see in verse 1 that 
it, it's a generality, uh, general statement says it, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the ground. And that part is what God commanded them to do. He said, go and fill the earth, right? He said, go and fill the earth. But something happened. And I will tell you that I studied this. I spent a lot of time on this particular section of, of in chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and to try and be able to have better answers for you on some of these terms and who some of these people were. And what I came up with is nobody really knows. In fact, most of my commentary said this is one of the most difficult passages in all the Bible to interpret, to understand, because there's just not enough known about this and um, there's about four theories about who the sons of God are that we're going to talk about in a little bit but see the sons of God saw that the daughters of saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took their they took them wise of all that they chose and now on the surface that doesn't necessarily sound like a bad thing but if we go to the next verse and Jehovah said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for that he is also his flesh, yet shall his days be a hundred and twenty years. The next one, please. And the Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. This is a different version that I studied, so I was expecting a, a different phrase to come before and in. But God is not happy. In fact, this verse here, verse 6, 4, is wedged in between two passages that indicates God is not happy with what's going on. So go ahead and uh, give me 6, 5. And Jehovah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented Jehovah that he had made man on the earth, and then it grieved him in his heart. Now hold up there. Uh, go back to 6.4, please, Brittany. Now, the controversy in this section is who's the Nephilim and who's the, the children of God. And like I said, there's about four running theories. And to the best of my memory, I'll give them to you. One is that the Nephilim were angels that came down from heaven and directly had relations with the women of the earth the other one is that they came down and possessed the men and then they had relations other is that they were a line seth's line had relations with women from the line of cain um, and then another one is kind of a variation on those first three they don't really know the point is that sin corrupted civilization in fact, this, as they're talking about this last part of verse 4 says, the same were mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. It even affected those who were thought of highly in their society. Their heroes and men of high regard. Sin affected them. Okay, so we can go back to 6.6 six now. And God grieved. He said, no. And we have to wonder how much does our sin grieve God today. We know that God said that he would not destroy the world with a flood. He gave us the rainbow. That's the promise. Okay, let's continue on. And Jehovah said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the ground, both man and beast and creeping things and birds of the, the heavens, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Jehovah. Would you get 9 and 10, please, as well? 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man and perfect in his generation. And here's this phrase. Noah walked with God. Just like his great-grandfather, whoops, Noah walked with God. Now, 
Enoch was taken. We don't know where the illusion. It's, we're kind of led to believe that God took him up to heaven. The writer does not state that. We know that Enoch was taken because he walked with God. And if you go back a verse, it says 300 years. And here, Noah walked with God. That is not an insignificant phrase. If you'll pull up the slide that I have there, that might take them a little bit. I have just one slide. There's a couple other scriptures that, that uh, in Hebrews 11, um, well, here. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. And Hebrews eleven seven says, By faith, Noah, when, he, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. And if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. So we get a better understanding of how God viewed Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Now, did Lamech know that when he named his son? And his, Noah means that he's going to help kind of reverse the curse? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, the last thing you think of, I mean, when your child is born, whether you're a father or a mother, you look at that child and, and you envision great things for that child. You don't envision them being in poverty or in prison or uh, homeless or anything like that. You envision great things for them. We all want them to become better than we were. And so I imagine Lamech probably had this, and when he looked at Noah, something came over him, and he, that, you know, uh, he named him. He, for some reason, he placed some sort of hope in his son. But because God was pleased with Noah, go ahead to uh, the next section, Brittany. He chose to reveal his plan to Noah. These are, so, and the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. That was another, like I said, the earth just exponentially, geometric proportions, descended into um, sin and evil. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt for all, for all flesh, had corrupted their way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and thou shalt pitch, within, pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is how thou shalt make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and use modern measurements. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. Now I'm looking up at the ceiling and trying to guesstimate how tall that ceiling is. And I doubt it's much over, I don't think it's even 30 feet high to, from here to there. Um, in fact, it's... Anyway, it's probably somewhere in there. So you put another 15 feet on top, it'd be from the ground up about how, how tall the ark was. And, you know, 75 feet, uh, figure another, or about 50 feet inside, so figure another half. And then if you go to the football stadium, you, that's 100 yards, 300 feet, so you go another 50 yards. That's a big boat. It's nothing small. I had a reference, and I forgot to, to look it up this week, but it basically said that the ark could hold, contain over 6,000 sheep-sized animals. And they said that if you was to take the scale from the smallest to the biggest, the sheep is 
would be kind of the median or the, the average size. Um, now when we get into this, science has a problem because we have mountains that are 24,000, 27,000, I don't remember, feet tall at this time and there's not enough water on the earth to flood them. But back then, the mountains probably weren't as tall and my reference says that the earth actually contains enough water to flood the whole surface. If everything, if you took all the valleys, all the trenches out of the ocean and kind of started smooth filling those in and bringing the mountains down, the, there's enough water on the earth to cover the earth to 6,000 feet. We're at 2,500 feet currently. So that's another 3,500 above us. So just FYI. A light shalt thou make to the ark and to a cubit thou shalt finish it upward and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And I, behold, I do bring the flood of waters upon this earth to destroy all flesh. God wanted there to be no doubt who was doing this. Wherein is the breath of life from under the heaven? Everything that is in the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt come into the ark. Thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all the flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. So pairs. And we know that of the clean, it was basically two animals, one pair. And of the clean, it says seven, but it's more realistically seven pair. Of, of clean animals and um, that was probably for sacrificial reason and plus later on we know that Israel was called to a, a, a diet of to differentiate between clean and unclean of the birds after their kind and of the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing of the ground after its kind two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive and thou, excuse me, and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. How many stories have we read where the character didn't quite do all that God told him to do? We think of Saul. Saul didn't wait for Samuel to show up before making the uh, sacrifice because it wasn't his to make. And here Noah did everything that God asked him to do faithfully. Now, God's plan is executed. Go ahead, Brittany. We'll just continue on here. And Jehovah said unto Noah, Come thou and all the house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee seven and seven, the male and his female. And of the beasts that are not clean too, the male and his female. Of the birds also of the heaven, seven and seven, and male and female, and to keep seed, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days... And I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living thing that I have made, I will destroy from off the face of the ground. Now, I was complaining earlier and have been kind of complaining about my trip to Asheville, North Carolina. And it's going to take me almost 23 hours by the time I leave Boise to the time I get to, to there. They had to wait seven days before it started raining in that ark. And... I'm going to be less than 24 hours, so I think I can, I can deal with that. And Noah did according to, once again, Noah did everything that God asked him to do. Go ahead. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Now, with first, now I don't know how long it took Noah to build the ark, but we know that Noah didn't have all three sons until he was 500 years old. 
and now he's 600 years old. So somewhere up to 100 years it took him to build that ark. Like I said, I don't know. I doubt it took him a year um, just because of the, the, the grand scale of it all. But anyway, so somewhere between whatever, uh, you know, up to 100 years it took him to build that ark. Um, we know there were tools because we can read from the, 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 the line of Cain that um, Jubal Cain made tools out of iron and bronze. So Noah went in and he had to wait. Let's go ahead and uh, get to the next one here. Of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of the birds and everything that creep upon the ground. So God is preparing to not just save Noah and his family, but he's got to give them things so that they can survive after this flood. He's got to maintain the ecosystem. So there went into, into, into Noah into the ark, male and female, as God commanded Noah. And it came to pass after the seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day were all the fountain, now, all the fountains of the great deep, underground springs, somehow, somewhere, there was still water in the earth that God caused to come out. And not only that, but the waters in the heaven that were stored up there. were broken up and the windows of the heaven of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights i've been through some rainstorms and you, you listen to the hurricane stuff that's that's going on and i was never super interested in hurricanes until Lori and i were down at cabo san lucas for our 25th wedding anniversary and we had to cut that short because of a hurricane um, so I started paying more attention now to hurricanes and the amount of rain that they dump over the course of, you know, you hear things like 10 inches in an hour. I, I, I can't imagine that. Um, you know, I've seen it rain a couple inches in an hour and it, you know, that's pretty heavy, but I can't imagine what they were thinking when, and, and you know what that sounds like when it's beating on your roof. Imagine you're in this ark and this rain for 40 days and 40 nights is just pounding and this is interesting in this account in the self same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark they and every beast after the kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark and two and two and all flesh were in there and wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female, all the flesh as God commanded him. And, Je and get this, and Jehovah, God shut him in. God sealed the door. I also find it interesting, the repetition, because the writer wants you to know that two of every kind went in, because he repeats it like five or six times here to the reader. And not only with two of every kind, but seven of the clean kind went in. And it even gives kind of a date and a timeline on the... Because remember, when this is written, this was written by Moses for the children of Israel after they came out of Egypt. And it was written so precise that God gave them the month, day, the year, kind of the year, month, and, and, and day that this all took place. Now for us, that's all been lost. We don't really know. But for them, it was real. I mean, really real. For us, I believe it was real, um, even though Noah's Ark has yet to be found, although I've heard some people, some stuff, and 
uh, who think that they have actually found it, um, but I've not heard any follow-up on that. So and I guess until that happens, that uh, is speculation. What would the world think if we actually found Noah's Ark and could prove it was Noah's Ark? And it was at like 17,000 feet. No more localized floods, huh? Okay, Brittany, we can continue. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth. Actually, it was more than 40 days upon the earth, as we'll find out in just a little bit. And, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went up the face of the waters, went up upon the face of the waters, excuse me. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high mountains that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward. It's like 27 and a half feet. Upward did the waters prevail, and that means above the tops of whatever was there. And the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. Of all that was on the dry land died. And I want you to take note. This is more than once that this is the made mention of the breath of life that God gave. It was his to give and it's his to take. And every living thing was destroyed that was upon the face of the ground. Both man and cattle and creeping things and birds of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only was left and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. That's how long it took the waters to recede. But Noah couldn't get out after the waters completely receded because if any of you, you know, we have, you know, mud puddles and this boggy stuff and uh, it just, uh, you know, it still takes a while for the soil to dry out. And uh, we have farmers here, we have people who've done dairy work and stuff, and you know what happens with cattle when they get out there and they start getting, you know, buried up to their, up, up to their uh, bellies and stuff. Um, they would have died. They would have been stuck in the mud. And God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of the heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually and after the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. And the ark rested on the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Once again, there's this time deal. God was being specific and precise. Unfortunately, we can't look at our calendars and go back that far and, and figure that out. They can get, you know, roughly a, a good guesstimate uh, because too much information has been lost over the, course of the, over the course of all those thousands of years. And the waters decrease continually until the 10th month. So you're looking at two and a half months. On the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, and it went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. And he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. And she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Now the raven didn't return. The ravens are probably less picky. Don't know. Um, but anyway, the raven didn't return, but the, the dove did. In fact, it took several tries 
of him releasing the dove before the dove didn't return. And he put forth his hand and took her and brought her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him at eventide, and lo, in her mouth an olive leaf plucked off. So now we have vegetations growing. So things are progressing. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the 601st year. So remember, he got in, and when he was 600, now he's 601. So he's been in that ark for a year. That's a pretty big boat, but I think I'd be going stir crazy after a while. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month of the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering off of the ark and looked and beheld. The face of the ground was dried. And in the second month, on the seventh and twelfth day of the month, was the earth dry. And God spake unto Noah, saying, now God told them to get in the ark. Now God's telling them to get out of the ark. Go forth from the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all the flesh, both birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth. Once again, go and fill the earth. And be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. <laughs> every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, whatsoever moveth upon the earth after their families went forth out of the ark. And Noah builded an altar unto Jehovah, and took of every clean beast and of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Jehovah smelled the sweet savor, and Jehovah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for that the imagination of man's heart. Now, get this. I almost passed it up, and I had made a note that I wanted to point this out. See, God said, remember, he cursed the earth. Now, I will not again curse the earth any more for man's sake. So in a way, Noah was properly named. I never realized that until I studied to do this sermon. God used Noah, and then after this, God said, okay, I'm not going to curse the ground anymore. It's cursed enough. I've wiped it out. I've, we're starting over. For that now here, but God also makes this point. This is a very important point. For that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And other translations, children, little ones, were born that way. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Okay. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So God says... Everything is going to stay the same as long as the earth remains. Well, we know as Christians, we've read the end of the book. We know that there's going to come a time when this earth and heavens will pass away. And we also know that when heaven and earth pass away, so will the sun and the moon and the stars. That we, as we know it, because God will be our light. We won't have the need of those anymore. Okay, Brittany. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Once again, that blessing. And the fear of you... Now, this is a change, okay? Because before, there was no fear of animals, between animals and man. Because if there was, God wouldn't have to say this. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens. With all were wherewith the ground teemeth and all the fishes of the sea into your hand they are delivered 
Every moving thing that liveth shall be food for you, as the green herb I have given you all. So, something changed once again. Sin had an effect. Now there was separation. Remember, was separation between God and man, and then man and man, and now separation between man and animal. There's this fear. There's this, the relationship was torn and broken. And God re also reestablishes man's authority over creation. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall not ye eat. And surely your blood, the blood of your lives, will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it. And at the hand of man, even at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. So, if the animals kill the man, there's a judgment for that animal. God says, I will require the life of that animal. There's going to be, it's going to be held accountable. And that's weird for us to think, but yet that's what the scripture tells us. And also, we're accountable to each other and to God for the life of our brothers and sisters. So whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And you, be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token. This is just a token. It's a symbol of the covenant which I make between me and you. Now, just because it's a token doesn't mean it's not important, it's not relevant. Because we have the assurance that when we see the rainbow to this day, we know God made this promise. To us and his creation, never again would he destroy the whole world with a flood. Between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant as if God could forget. Okay? It's for our benefit. Because we can look at the rainbow and know that God sees the rainbow when we both can know God's promise. Which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth and God said unto Noah this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth okay. so we've discussed that but we have us as Christians we have as important as that covenant is we have one that's just more important and that's the covenant that God gave us through his son Jesus Christ we have seen the devastating effects of sin we saw how it spiraled from just eating something that you weren't supposed to eat to murder to the whole world becoming corrupted where God had to wipe that out and start over. And even Noah, being a, was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and who walked with God, sin was still in the world. As we know, because as we read, there's still sin happening in the world 
But see, our hope is not so much placed in God's rainbow and that promise. Our hope is placed in something else. Because you see, God was still working to crush the head of the serpent. And he used Noah and his family to further that along. So when we do look up and see the rainbow, we're reminded that God said he would never destroy the world again with water. And we can be confident that he remembers that. And when we look around and we see a world corrupted by sin, we can take comfort in the words of Jesus. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And some of you might say, well, great, what does that have to correlate with the rainbow? And I would give you this, that the sign that we have today is a sign of an empty grave. That tomb is empty because he's not there. Because Jesus Christ died for us and rose again. And even though we live in a world that seems to be descending more into chaos and sin daily, we know that we have salvation. We are going to be those who are, I guess, in the ark of God's love. In his high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus prays this to the Father. He said, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it in front of me. He says, Father, he says, I pray that you'd protect those whom you have given me. He goes, you have given me in my hand and nobody can take them out of my hand. And he said, even if somebody could take them out of my hand, they can't take them out of your hand. So we're in that ark of safety because we're in God's hands. And whenever we go through life today and we have trials and tribulations, we can remember that we're in that ark of safety, that God has us covered. God never promised that there wouldn't be trouble. In fact, Jesus Christ promised there would be trouble. But he also promised that uh, he's overcome the world. And I see that we are running late, and I apologize for that. So I'm going to wrap this up with prayer. If you'll bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you this afternoon. We want to thank you for the rainbow. We want to thank you for the reminder of your promise, Lord, that you are faithful to honor that promise. And Lord, we know that there's a greater promise that we can cling to. That we are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. That we have eternal life through him. Lord, that you have reconciled us back to you through him. And because we have that forgiveness and we are covered in the blood, that we don't have to worry about our future, Lord, because our future is in you. We know that we are secure because, Lord, nobody can take us from your hand. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jody, and let's all stand and open the hymn notes to hymn number 248. We're going to sing Standing on the Promises, hymn number 248. <laughs> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages may his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I 
I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the hellish towards the doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail, listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Rest in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Remember the barbecue for those that like to stay and enjoy that. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we again come before you just, Lord, so grateful for your love and mercy you show to us, your plan of salvation, Lord, and all the promises you give to us. And we'll be eternally grateful for the promises of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.